Nigel's documentary, Dangerous Highway. Also coming up, anchor for psychiatric nurses to boycott meeting with health minister. And on the foreign front, Oxfam says it will set up a commission to investigate past and present allegations of exploitation by staff. So we have the detail of these as well as the latest in sports and entertainment all in the next 60 minutes. You want to stay with us right here. And, uh, well, you can also stay interactive with us on our platforms. Facebook is TV3 Ghana, Twitter is TV3 underscore Ghana. Let's settle for the detail now. And the Auditor General has given hints that salaries of public officials who engage in financial malfeasance will be blocked. Last week, the Auditor General, Daniel Domelevo, told the press his department will no longer depend on the Public Accounts Committee of Parliament in its fight against abuse and embezzlement of public funds. Now, my colleague Daniel Opoku joins me for the detail of this one. Right, Daniel, thanks for joining us. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Nikia. Now, tell us, what is this plan of the Auditor General aimed at? So, let me hear you again. I'm asking, what is this whole plan of the uh, Auditor General in that? What does he hope to achieve? Right. Basically, what the Auditor General is saying that they conduct some few investigations in the various public sector ministries and realize that most of the accountants after they have done their work or after they have issued some payments, actually do file fraudulent receipts for government to repay them again. For that reason, we were involved. And um, some of them complied, responded in the letters, others did not. For that reason, as part of their measures, that's what they are intended to do. And also, it is part of their Section 21, the Audit Service Laws, Section 21, that if in case uh, the Auditor General writes to you, complaining about an issue for you to offer an explanation, you decline to do so. The Auditor General has the powers in consultation with the Controller Accountant General to block your salary. That's the decision the Auditor General has taken. And he said that very soon, that's the next, next month, that he's going to embark on this particular directive. Next month, as in the month of March, that is when it is taking effect. Exactly, exactly. Right. It's because um, the law, which allows them to do that, gives additional 30 days for those who... Um, more or less involved in this act to officially respond back to the Auditor General. So within this 30-day period, beyond a 30-day period, if they don't do that, you uh, direct for their salaries to be blocked. Daniel, we're grateful for that update. Daniel Lopoku there, my colleague, joining us from the Auditor General's Department on that new directive going to take place in the month of March. Let's move on to health now. And the Ministry of Health was today expected to hold an emergency meeting with representatives of nurses and physician assistants at the Anchor Falls Psychiatric Hospital to deal with the impasse at the facility. But the staff have boycotted the meeting. A statement from the nurses and physician assistants on the action said they are removing themselves from the danger posed to their mental and physical health by what they say is the illegal, oppressive, traumatic, degrading, abusive, embarrassing, and general egocentric behavior of the hospital director, Dr. Eugene Dodoye. Now, Why, so with that, their stand is on uh, the Labour Act. We will be telling you exactly what it means from the perspective of the nurses and the psychiatric uh, assistants there. Looking at Section 119 of the Labour Act 651, the reason why they are taking that stance there. Exactly what does that act talk about with regards to the issues they are raising, exposure to imminent hazards? How would you react if you are exposed to imminent hazards. Well, according to 119 clause 1, it says that when a worker finds himself or herself in any situation at the workplace, which she or he has reasonable cause to believe represents an imminent and serious danger to his or her life, 
safety or health, the worker shall immediately report this fact to his or her immediate supervisor and remove himself or herself from the situation. So that is what they are standing on to take that action. It goes further to suggest that an employer shall not dismiss or terminate the employment of a worker or withhold any remuneration of the worker who has removed himself or herself from a work situation which the worker has reason to believe represents imminent and serious danger to his or her life, safety or health. Finally, an employer shall not require a worker to return to work in circumstances where there is a continuing imminent and serious danger to the life, safety or health of the worker. So that is what uh, they are basing their facts on. That is the nurses and physician assistants there to take that stand. Well... Kofi Davo is a labor expert and really will this stand. Good afternoon to you, Kofi. I'm very grateful for your time. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure. So the nurses are saying that they are not on strike, but they are taking action under the Section 119 of the Labor Act 2003, Act 651. Now, they are saying that their director is causing them mental, physical health by their illegal, oppressive, all the terms that they are using. We want to find out from you, does it really hold the argument of these nurses, does it fall under Section 119 of the Labour Law? Um, thank you very much. I don't think so, in my opinion. Um, in, in, in any employment contract, I, I believe, as will be the case with the, with the nurses, there is a grievance procedure. Where you make an allegation against an employer, you go to a grievance procedure, and the facts of the matter are established, a conclusion arrived at and remedies are sought as per the contract of employment. I, my understanding of Section 119 is having to do with the physical condition of the environment under which the nurses may be working. And therefore, I, I, I suspect that they, they may be, they may be up, misapplying the section on the basis of which they have taken that action. That's agreed. Now, this issue has been on for months now. Mental Health Authority says that the Labor Commission must come in to settle the matter. What more can the Labor Commission do with the staff having an entrenched position that they have taken? Well, the Labor Commission um, would have to invite them, possibly take them through a mediation process and try to reconcile the two positions or um, get them into an arbitration process for a ruling to be made by an arbitrator or a panel of arbitrators for this matter to be resolved. So that, that would be the options available to the uh, Labor Commission. I want to believe that the Labor Commission also would, would try and get the workers back to work in the interim whilst um, steps are taken to resolve and reconcile their differences. Kofi Davo, we are grateful for your time this afternoon. Kofi Davo is a labor expert there touching on the nurses and uh, psychiatric assistance issue pending. Away from that, let's talk road safety. And February 15, 2018, exactly six years old. Project and mixed bear the facts, the figures, and the fun moments, the chills and the lamentations, the plights and pleas of users. In 2008, Ghana's then president, John Ejikum Kufo, decided to name a future six-lane highway after a president of the United States of America. Mr. President, in appreciation of your many kind gestures towards Ghana, and other parts of Africa, and to immortalize your goodwill to us. My government has decided to name this road, this very strategic road, after you. Henceforth, it will be called the George Bush Motorway. I really appreciate the George Bush motorway.
The next time I come and ride on the George Bush motorway, I promise that we will not shut the highway down. <laughs> On 15 February 2012, the 14.1 kilometer George Walker Bush Highway, also referred to as the N1 Highway, was officially opened to motorists. I am happy for two main reasons. The first one is that President Ajakum Kufo agreed to be here this afternoon. As you know, he initiated this project. They started and we finished it. The important thing is that it is a Ghana project. The motorway is expected to facilitate the movement of more than 36,000 vehicles per day and reduce peak time travel from one hour to 20 minutes. Funded by the U.S. government Millennium Challenge Corporation at a cost of $175 million, the purpose of the highway was to address the bottleneck on portions of the stretch which caused delay of exports and imports, especially at Malam Junction. Six years after its construction, the joy that came with the commissioning of the highway has turned to tears of sorrow for families who have lost loved ones. Twenty-one-year-old Isaac Nyamu was a young adult with special needs who wanted to make a difference in society. He died while crossing the Abekala Pass section of the N1 Highway on 18th June 2017. Men, <laughs> The main traffic light was indicating red, but the traffic light by the U10 was indicating green. People were crossing. My son was the last to cross. A car at top speed approached suddenly and hit him. It's not me who got to say what is happening at that very spot because everybody knows and even the top men they know what is happening there. You have to do something about it. You have to do something about it. You know, at least you you guys get a record since the judge woke up Bush motorway when it was completed. See the accidents which has been happening there. What are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? We still wait for people to lose their kids, people to lose their family, keep on losing their family before we take action. 
At least one, two, three. We have to know that what is happening there. We have to do something about it. No, they don't care. Well, why? Just want to know why. Now, the Dangerous Highway documentary was widely viewed last night at La Paz. Residents were happy at the expose by TV3, which testified were real everyday situations. They want authorities to respond as a matter of urgency to save their lives. Ashanti Home Touch, a popular joint in La Paz, was the unofficial venue for the premiere people watched with keen interest as their daily struggles were highlighted to the world. Some of them had personal experiences on the dangerous highway, though unpleasant. I was watching the document and like I've seen it well, so I know how it is. It's very sad. It's very sad. And we live around so always uh, that kind of, I mean, Fear, hey, fear the inside us because of that road. It's very risky. Ebi atomeda. Ah, look at me over here. Ah, I went for four days. You me. were knocked down by a car. Yep. On this road. Because of what? There was no street. The bridge. It wasn't there. So we have to do it. Do it. So please. What? Sometimes when the cars are coming, you can't cross it. Um, even um, uh, when you mess up, a car will hit you. So when you are crossing, uh, you must be very careful. And sometimes even the pregnancy women and the kiddies, it's very difficult for them to cross the, the other side. So it's very, very hardly. It's very hardly. When president is watching me now, um, um, what I want to tell him, um, you have to help us. We are facing a lot of problems here. I want them to educate us more about the rule, how to cross. So if the education is more, more people will get to know how to cross the rule. So the, the accident will be reduced. But if the people is not like they don't know much about the, the rule, that that caused more more accidents. The residents were hopeful this documentary will get results that could probably end their plight. I <laughs> So He is telling me how he was knocked down by a car at one midnight. He was a bit drunk and so before he realized he was knocked down by a vehicle and then he only realized how serious it was when he was trying to get up and he couldn't. He says he was rushed to Kolebu Teaching Hospital and he spent two weeks at the intensive care unit. This is just to tell you how serious the situation is here at La Paz in Accra and how urgent it is for authorities to do something real fast about it. I feel scared when I'm crossing. So I think if they do the overhead, it will help us. I may be heading towards police container. I'm going to the Echo Bank there. So that place is where the footbridge should have been placed. Now, the next one is at flat top. So it means if you live around that particular area, it means you have to cross the road by any means. And by so doing, a lot of people have been knocked down. Some people have suffered injuries, others too, lives have been taken. One footbridge should be placed at where the, uh, the, the traffic light is. I believe if that, because mostly that's where everybody crosses the road. I'm two years ni. Can't be bobu a branch inside the wire. Begin to come touch anymore. But then someone can say, "You, to be crazy, to me, him." And say, "You move on." Say, "Sir, by say, we're ahead." And your mom was never been brought last time as lean more. Yeah, pa. Those were uh, some comments by people who are residents. Some of them are also working here, uh, and they are testing to how real it is 
the things that they saw in the video and also pleading with the concerned authorities to come to their aid by making sure that at least some footbridges are constructed at the various vantage points where people cross the road most to at least reduce the number of road accidents on the road from Ashanti Home Touch in La Paz where we enjoyed the premiering of the TV3 special documentary on the dangerous highway Catherine Fempoma for TV3 News. And remember the hashtag is Killer Roads on Twitter and on Facebook TV3 Ghana. Let's keep the advocacy going. We need results. Now to the Western region, the Vice President has repeated government's decision to use mineral resources from that region to expand the economy. He was speaking during a Ketsi call on the Omaheni of Esikado in the Western region. Nana Kobina Nketia. Dr. Mohamed Baumia expressed concern over the huge borrowings made over the years by earlier governments. He explained that Ghana abounds in mineral resources, but these have been depleted due to mismanagement. Dr. Baumia said under the MPP government, new initiatives will be rolled out to capitalize on the use of the minerals. You have oil, you have minerals, and so on. Uh, and when you have smuggling activity, it means it adversely affects the state. We don't get the revenue that we need. Uh, and then you have to go and borrow and de depend on other people. He again solicited the support of Omaheni Nanakob Nanketia to help tackle smuggling in the Western region. The Vice President Baumia reassured the Omaheni of Esikado that government is committed to a strong policy beyond aid. We want to move beyond aid, as we keep saying. But moving beyond aid means taking the right decisions. And, and, and making the best use of our own resources, the sea um, and the maritime resources that we have are very, very important. The Omaihe of Esikado Nanako Blanketia praised government for its hard work, especially its decision to relocate the Ghana National Petroleum Corporation to Takrade. He again pleaded with the government to involve traditional leaders whenever new laws and regulations are promulgated. Unemployment, the Omaihine lashed out at politicians who request party cars before providing jobs to Ghanaians. Anybody who employs people based on party, based on ethnicity, is doing a disservice to the, to the thought that produced this nation. We have seen people ask for party cars before they employ people to even do laboring jobs. Then you ask yourself, the white man ruled us through our divisions, DVD at Impera. Why do we keep on dividing ourselves and that unity is strength? The Omahi Nanakom Nanketia, through his elders, implored the vice president to renovate the Fianquanta Hospital. Well, we're still remaining in the Western region because nine diesel fuel smugglers are in the grips of the Western region police for duping the state millions of Ghana cities to the smuggling of 120,000 liters of fuel. Now, the smugglers were arrested by the Western Naval Commander and are expected to be arraigned before court next week. The Vice President, Dr. Mahamud Baumia, who visited the sites for the smuggling activity, pledged to roll out measures to stop the stealing. The Vice President visited the Western Region Naval Command to acquaint himself with their operations. His visit was also to be abreast with the methods employed in the stealing of diesel fuel to be sold to ships on higher seas. The Western Naval Command said these smugglers procure boats which can carry more than 120,000 liters of diesel fuel. The diesel fuel, according to the command, is brought to the land through tankers before being offloaded into boats. The naval commander again explained that the arrest of nine persons will inform policy direction. The Western Naval Flag Commander, Isaac Osekufo, expressed worry over the operations of these smugglers. They agree on a position at sea to rendezvous and the times and everything are arranged. They determine when perhaps no ship is going to sea, and then the canoes. And these are very wide. I have never seen any such canoes in my life before, sir. 
he appealed to the vice president to initiate policy measures to address the problem. The vice president, who told the site of the smuggling activity, spoke about measures to clamp down on fuel smugglers. These are not normal canoes, uh, but these are canoes that are locally made. Uh, and we've got to make sure that um, we look out for these canoes and, and, and confiscate them to the extent possible and, and, and have enough intelligence on the sea to be able to stop some of the bunkering activity. Dr. Mohamed Baumia said, these new policy initiatives will be rolled out soon. We are going to be um, very forcefully dealing with. And so I leave, I've come here uh, and, and I'm leaving um, quite uh, well informed reasonably about the challenge and have some good ideas about what we are going to do. And implementing some of those policies, uh, we'll, we will see that soon. Already, experts have argued that the stealing of fuel has polluted the Western Naval Command waters and affecting fish catch. Figures from the Ministry of Fisheries indicate that Ghana's fish catch has dwindled by about 10%. The sector minister, Nafoli, also emphasized on new measures through legal frameworks to address the problem. We want to establish more improved relationship with the artisanal fishers, the small-scale fishers, who constitute the majority of, of our fisher folk, uh, to also go into a close season. The Ghana Center for Democratic Development, CDD Ghana, says government must work in removing any form of political interference in the implementation of the Infrastructure for Poverty Eradication Program. Research officer and team leader of the IPEP project at CDD Ghana, Mohamed Awal, says this can contribute to the failure of the development authorities. IPEP is a program being implemented by government to address the problem of poverty in rural areas by expanding and improving upon existing infrastructure at the district level to create jobs, accelerate growth and reduce poverty. Some of the programs under this project include the One District One Factory, One Village One Dam, One Constituency One Million US Dollars and One District One Warehouse Policy enshrined in the governing NPP 2016 manifesto. CDD Ghana has initiated a project to track the implementation of IPEP by the government. A research officer and team leader of the IPEP project at CDD Ghana, Mohamed Awal, tax government to ensure that the development authorities are not used as political party vehicles to dispense patronage to individual financiers in a manner that distracts it from its mandate. As much as it's a political party manifesto program, when it becomes a public policy, we need to understand what existing bureaucratic structures exist in the state to be able to help them even as a party to deliver. We also called for an improvement in the communication of IPEP's success stories, impact and spending to stakeholders and the wider public in order to be more accountable. It's important that we create a framework where citizens are involved, citizens can hold uh, the process accountable, the institutional framework, the managers who have been set up, the development authorities, how do citizens participate in their process? How do we get enough information to be able to hold them accountable? Director at the Ministry of Special Development Initiative, Joseph Kognuru, says his outfit has reservations with the findings. They could not talk to most of the people perhaps we have dealt with. Like I said, we had, cons we had consultations at, at the regional levels, at almost all the regions. When the bills were ready, we did this consultation again with parliamentarians in all the zones. So they, it depended on who they met and who they spoke to, they would be able to have that, uh, that kind of findings that they have. This is Midday Live. We return shortly with business. Stay with us. Thanks for staying with us. In business this afternoon, Principal Research Analyst at the Petroleum Unit of the Institute of Energy Security, Richmond Roxon, has suggested the scrapping of a special petroleum tax or setting a threshold to determine when to apply the tax. He indicated the 2% reduction of the tax is woefully inadequate. 
The special petroleum tax was introduced in 2016 at a rate of 17.5% on the face value of fuel sold at the local pumps. It was reduced to 15% in the 2017 budget. Principal research analyst at the Petroleum Unit of Institute of Energy Security, Richmond Roxin, lauded government for the effort at reducing the tax by another 2%, bringing it down to 13% but he indicated it was inadequate. 2% will not even be enough to close uh, what we've experienced in 2018 alone. 2% per litre will be around 10 pesos per litre. And from the estimates that Honorable Asibe himself made, that if you add the 2% the reduction to the decreases that we're already expecting because it's a new pricing window and we've had positive indicators, we're, we're going to have something in region of 3 to 4%. We'll be around 15 to 20 pesos depending on the oil marketing company considering uh, the current figures that we have that will move it from around 21 ghana cities to 20 cities 30 pesos he urged government to show more commitment and understand the plight of Guineans by reducing drastically prices of fuel or scrap entirely the special petroleum tax the revenue argument will come, but we still maintain that fuel prices, uh, they are not the only avenues that governments can raise revenues from. We can look at other innovative ways of raising revenues aside um, the special petroleum tax still being uh, in the price build up. He suggested the best way to deal with the issue is for government to set a threshold on crude price above which the tax will not apply. It would have even been better for government to say, let's have a threshold that if it crosses this barrier, we'll take the SPT out. If it, it, it comes down to this level, we'll introduce the SPT. That would have even been fair. Just like the, the current system that we have, something like an adjustment formula, automatic adjustment formula, where immediately it gets to a certain threshold, you know that this is it. But to even have it as a specific tax, we, we don't welcome it. And the Ghana Revenue Authority and the Ghana Immigration Service have signed a memorandum of understanding for the establishment of a joint border management committee. The Commissioner General of the Ghana Revenue Authority, Emmanuel Kofiinti, said the event is a step in the right direction to end Ghana's uncoordinated and inefficient border management system. The Ghana Immigration Service and the Customs Division of the Ghana Revenue Authority have taken steps to operationalize processes to secure the borders of Ghana through an integrated border management IBM approach. As part of the processes, the two agencies have agreed to jointly patrol the borders, share intelligence and information, use resources common to the two agencies, and undertake joint operations and investigations as well as training. It has not been easy getting to this stage. Change is always difficult. And there have always been resistance at various turns and corners. But per from perseverance and your support, we have been able to reach this milestone. The Commissioner General of the Ghana Revenue Authority, Emmanuel Kofi Inting, deemed the event as momentous in the history of the two institutions, adding it lays the foundation for a conflict-less border patrol. I appreciate the efforts of these two organizations to come to an understanding that they would henceforth serve the national interest better if they are able to work together. The signing of the memorandum of understanding will therefore be the beginning for us at the GRA and the Ghana Immigration Service to properly coordinate border operations in the interest of the country. The two agencies have agreed to pilot the IBM project at the Aplau border post and later extend it to all border posts. And to some more business news is that to the program officer for Social Enterprise Development Foundation sent Ghana, Harriet Nyama Ajiman, has called on government to review suspended capitation grants within the health and education sectors. She was speaking at a roundtable discussion on democratic governance and inequality in Africa. The event, dubbed Exploring the Nexus Between Budget Allocation and Inequality, sought to explain allocation decisions in the 2018 budget and highlighted important areas of concern. 
the program manager of Oxfam, Zakaria Suleimana, is certain that closing the inequality gap okay. is overdue. Yeah, yeah. Harriet Nyamajiman bemoaned the lack of sustainability plans for key projects in the health and education sector. When we implemented the free compulsory basic education, we're happy. Now we are extending it to free senior high. We're also happy. There should be a time that education should be accessible to every Ghanaian. That should not be negotiable. Parents who can afford at least should be allowed to contribute. Let's save some resources. The government will have to do well to think of a sustainability plan, financial sustainability, to rescue our health insurance. The team advised that tackling inequality should be focused on the pre-planning stage. Why, so talking about FIFA's men ranking, where is Ghana placed? Well, Thierry Nyan will be telling us after this. Stay with us. And on entertainment this afternoon, three cherished listeners of 3FM and Onya FM won gift vouchers in the Media General Valentine's Day promotion. They were judged to have had the most intriguing stories after sharing fascinating tales about their love journey on 3FM's morning show, Sunrise. <laughs> Accounts on how people fall in love will vary from one marriage to the other. Cherished listeners of 3FM had the chance of reliving their love journey on Val's Day. Three couples with the most fascinating tale won gift vouchers to shop for free at Melcom. They had a very interesting story. For instance, one couple said they met because the, the woman had done an illegal connection. And uh, uh, the, the, the husband had gone there because he was working with ECG and one thing led to another and they fell in love. Time for shopping. couples were appreciative of the Val's Day shopping experience. So I picked something sweet for my sweet wife okay. and I'm happy. Something red as well. Yeah, as you know, <laughs> as you see, you see, he's ready for the Val's. Yeah. I can imagine. Yeah. What about you? What did you pick? I picked um, teddy bear mm -hmm. and then some few items, okay. chocolates. Valentine Day without chocolates will not be a Valentine Day. Exactly. That's so. true. And our couple on the other side, what did you pick? You have a baby, so what did you pick? I picked stuffs for my baby, and then the flowers for... Today is Vaz Day, so I pick a flower for myself and then for my husband. Godwin Avonado is the director of communication for the Melcom Group. For us, love means sharing company. And uh, for people in retail business, what we have done is to stock up to satisfy the needs of people who want to exchange gifts. 3FM, Mokobe. TV3, you are the best in news, best entertainment. And 3FM, yeah, my best station. You are doing good. Keep it up. Right, so let's continue to show the love. It's happening here tomorrow at 8 a.m. Talking about the blood donation. Be part and show some love. Let's do international news now. And Oxfam says it will set up a commission to investigate past and present allegations of exploitation by staff. Oxfam International's Executive Director, Winnie Bayima, said it would do justice and atone for the past. Oxfam International's Executive Director invited victims to come forward for justice to be done for them, saying she was here for all the women who have been abused. The British charity has faced criticism over the way it handled claims staff hired prostitutes in Haiti in 2011.
And police say the teenager accused of killing 17 people at a Florida high school on Wednesday has confessed to the shooting. Nicolas Cruz, 19, said he arrived on campus and began shooting students before abandoning his weapon and escaping, according to a court document. He has appeared in court charged with 17 counts of premeditated murder. The FBI has admitted it received a tip off about him last year. The attack at Majority Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, is the deadliest U.S. school shooting since 2012. And that will be it for Midday Live. Remember, there's more news updates on our website. It's 3news.com, also TV3 Ghana. You can keep the interaction going on. My name is Nanikia Mensah-Brampa. Enjoy your lunch and have a good afternoon.